Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, a few moments ago, Steve read the first part of the chapter. We're going to study the second part of the chapter this morning. Erwin Lutzer uh, wrote a book that he simply titled, One Minute After You Die. The very first phrase is just a small book. I would encourage you to read it. It's challenging. But, but the very first phrase in the book says this, One Minute After You Die. You will either be enjoying a personal welcome from Jesus Christ into glory, or you will be catching a glimpse, your first glimpse, of gloom, of death, and destruction as you have never known it. What a sobering statement. For for many people, death is the great unknown. (laughs) It's, uh, it, it, it's the great uncertainty, uncertain as, to, uh, uncertain as to what is going to take place after they die. They choose to ignore the topic. They choose to not think about it. If you talk about death, they change the conversation. They avoid any thoughts of the hereafter. For them, it's now when they're living for the moment and they don't want to think about what is going to take place after death. Yet, quite frankly, overlooking death does not help us to escape it. Time marches on, and each day brings each and every one of us closer to eternity. One writer said that death is no respecter of persons. The percentages are equal. One out of every one person dies. The writer of Hebrews said it this way, and is appointed unto man to die once, but after this, the judgment. Jesus, who is the main character of our study in the book of Luke, was well aware of that reality. Jesus realized that that life, your life, and, and my life, transcends our existence here on earth. Although we were born into this world, we were not born exclusively for this world. Catch that statement. You and I were born into this world, but we were not born exclusively for this world. You see, death is not the end. Death is only the beginning. Someone has said this, that you're really not ready to live until you're ready to die. On a regular basis, uh, I have the privilege and the honor of officiating funeral services. We had another one right here yesterday. Uh, And we challenge people on a regular basis. One day, each and every one of us will have an appointment with death. I trust that you are ready. In the passage that we're studying this morning, Jesus relates a sobering story. He illustrates the fact that every person will experience one of two destinies. You see, this morning, I could tell your future. Not with specifics, but this morning, I guarantee you that every single one of us that are here this morning will spend eternity in one of two destinations. We will spend eternity in one of two places. The verses that we're going to read in just a few moments cry out for us to examine ourselves. I know it's a sobering thought, but are you ready for death? Are you prepared for eternity? What will happen to you one minute after you die? Would you pray with me today? Father, uh, thank you so much. For the privilege that we've had to lift our voices and worship you. Thank you that you are our God. You're not just a God, but you're our God who loves us and desires to have a personal relationship with you. 
Father, we praise you for that. And I pray this morning that each and every one of us would examine our lives. As Vernita said, help us to surrender ourselves. Help us to not hold anything back. But Lord, I pray you'd help us to examine our lives this morning in the light of eternity. Help us to understand what Jesus was saying in this passage and help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's passage ties in with the first part of the chapter that Steve read. We took some time and read those first 18 verses today for a reason. As Jesus told these stories, and by the way, we're in a section in which Jesus is telling parables and stories in, in, in a way that absolutely captured the attention and the imagination of the crowd Jesus emphasized several important points, and as Steve read through those verses, I I trust that you followed along, and, and there probably were a couple of verses that stood out to you, verses that you had heard before. And Jesus taught in the first part of the chapter several powerful and practical truths. Let me give them to you just by way of review. The first thing that Jesus said in the first part of the chapter is this, what you do with your finances matters to God. Let me just say that again, and I know so many times we think, boy, that's a personal, that's kind of uh, off limits, but Jesus says in the passage, what you do with your finances matters to him. Let me remind you, in verse 11 of this chapter, Jesus said this, he said, if you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Think about that. Those of us that that work and are employees or have employers, we understand that. If you have employees, you are not going to entrust something of greater importance to an employee who is not faithful with something of less importance. That's what Jesus is saying. Why, if you're not faithful in what he has given you here, what makes you think that he is going to entrust you with something greater? Verse 13, you're familiar with that verse. No servant, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, once again, that word mammon is a word that we don't use, and sometimes we jump right over it because we don't understand it. It was a first century word for money. And Jesus is saying, you cannot serve God and money at the exact same time. You're either serving one or you're serving the other. Here's the second truth that Jesus made in in the passage, and you'll see how this ties into our story today. Jesus says that God sees how you really are, not how you appear. Let me say that again. God sees how we really are. God's able to see this morning beyond our clothes. He's able to see beyond the way we look. He's able to see beyond our makeup. God's able to see beyond the way that we appear. And God is able to see how you and I really are. You see, this morning, as I'm looking at you externally, God is looking at you internally. As I see your outward appearance, God sees your inward condition. That's what Jesus said in verse 14. He says, you appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. Then he makes this statement that's powerful. He says, what the world honors is detestable to God. And I could park right there and we could preach for a long time. Because if we're not careful, we as believers honor that which the world honors. We lift up entertainment stars. We lift up all of these individuals in our culture that the world honors. And yet Jesus says, what the world honors, God detests. We need to be very careful that we're not honoring, that we're not worshiping, that we're not embracing something that does not honor God. Now with those thoughts in mind, and quite frankly with no additional introduction, Jesus moves right into the story that we are studying 
today. Now, before we dig into our passage, and we're going to read our passage in just a few moments, there's one really important point that we need to make, and I want you to look at your Bibles because your Bible probably has a heading over verse 19. If your Bible is like mine, my Bible says, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. That's important because uh, there's a lot of debate as to whether this is a parabolic story, whether it's a parable, or whether this is a real story. And although your Bible and mine calls it a parable, many conservative Bible scholars today believe that this is a real story and not a parable. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, as you read through, we've studied several parables the last few weeks. Parables are true to life, but hypothetical, illustrative stories. As you read through a parable, the names of specific individuals are never given. Jesus says, there was a man, or there was a woman that lost a coin. There was a shepherd. Parables are anonymous stories. But as we read through the verses that we're looking at today, even though the first gentleman is anonymous, Jesus specifically mentions the name of two people in this parable. If it is a parable, it's the only time that Jesus names the characters of the parable. The idea is this, that this story has all of the characteristics of a real life event. Additionally, if you study uh, biblical literature, the story does not have the normal form of a parable. A normal parable has an introduction, an analogy, a story, and then an application. The story is not like that. Instead, this story is in the form of a narration, of a real-life event, a real-life story given for the purpose of, of illustration. One author said this is not a parable. This is not a story. This rather is history. Jesus is telling something that really happened. Now quite frankly, the nature of the story does not change the reality of the message. If you walk away this morning saying, hey Brian, you know what? I still think it's a parable. That's cool. That's fine. If you say, Brian, I think this is a real story, a real life event, that's cool, that's fine. It doesn't change the reality, nor does it diminish the power of what Jesus is saying in these verses. So as we begin, Jesus is relating what I believe are real life events to a crowd that looked up to rich people, admired rich people, and ignored poor beggars. And so with that in mind, Jesus tells this story. Notice with me the text. Verse 19. Jesus said there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. Jesus begins the story with an unnamed man. Tradition calls him Dives. You maybe have heard him called Dives the Rich Guy. Well, Dives is simply the Latin term for rich, and so people have given him that name. Notice how the Bible describes this guy, though. First of all, it says that he had on fancy clothes. You said, Brian, where does it say that in the passage? Well, he, he wore purple. He dressed royally. Now, now, now I notice some of you are wearing purple this morning, and, and I want you to know in New Testament times, you would be dressed royally. The color purple was an expensive color that was only worn by the wealthy. This man was dressed in purple. He, the text says that he wore fine linen. Let me tell you, in, in, um, in elegant terms what it means, and then I'll simplify it in just a few minutes. The term fine linen refers to his expensive Egyptian linen undergarments. So this guy wore fine, expensive, foreign undergarments. This guy ate well. If you have a King James, it says that he fared sumptuously. 
Not only that, but he lived in a mansion. Uh, Several versions, I know we have various versions. The NIV says he lived in luxury. The NASB says he joyously lived in splendor. The Message Bible talks about him having conspicuous consumption. Here's Brian Burkholder's version. He ate a lot, all right? This guy, this guy knew how to live, and this guy knew how to eat. Here's the bottom line. Dives was the guy that lived in the big house. You know who I'm talking about. He ate a lot, and he wore really expensive underwear. This guy had it made. No doubt, this guy would have been on the television program Cribs. You ever watch the program Cribs? Uh, He would have been on the program Cribs dedicated to the houses of the rich and famous. Jesus talks about the rich man. But, But there's a second man in the story. Jesus calls him Lazarus. If Dives is the rich guy, let's call Lazarus the homeless guy. Notice verse 20 as we continue reading. At his gate, at the rich man's gate, lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing, hungry, looking, wanting the scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his source. Now the description, Jesus' description of Lazarus the homeless guy is just as colorful as Jesus' description of Dives the rich guy. Jesus says first of all that he was crippled. The idea is that he laid at the gate. This, this is a term that is often used to describe the sick and the lame. Well he was sick. He was covered with sores. He was covered with external ulcers. We know that he wasn't leprous. Some have tried to say that he was a leper. He wasn't leprous because he wasn't outside of the public gate. He was there outside the gate of the rich man. The text says very clearly that he was hungry. It describes him. He was longing for scraps. Here's what he did. He rummaged through the garbage looking for something to eat. Here's an interesting point. They say that during New Testament times, the really wealthy didn't use napkins. They say that the really wealthy would wipe their mouth and clean their teeth with bread. And then they would throw that bread away. If that's the case, that's what Lazarus was waiting for. He stood outside the gate waiting for the daily garbage to be dumped, the bread that the rich man had used to clean his mouth and to clean his teeth that probably had little scraps of meat on it. That's what Lazarus waited for. He was hungry. Not only was he hungry, but he was helpless. You say, Brian, how do you know he's helpless? The dogs came and licked his sores. Man, this was the culmination of Lazarus' ministry in, 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 in Jewish eyes and in, in New Testament times. Dogs were not romanticized as they are today. Dogs were not man's best friends. Dogs were seen as impure, disgusting, and scavengers. These weren't pets. These were wild, dirty dogs that came and ate from the sores that were on Lazarus's. Body. Now, anyone comparing these two guys would say, Man, the rich guy was blessed by God. No doubt that's the guy that's going to be in heaven. And Lazarus, man, this guy must have done something wicked. This guy must have done something terrible. He must have done something so that he would be cursed and end up in hell. I mean, as you've heard people say, good people with good hearts who love God don't end up like Lazarus. If you watch religious television, they're going to tell you that they end up like the rich guy. And yet Jesus, as he tells the story, tells it differently. Remember how we said in the message there earlier in chapter 16, that God sees how we really are, not how we appear. 
The point that Jesus is making, one of the points that Jesus is making in the story is this. Appearances are deceiving. The rich man seemed to have it all together, but on the inside, he was an absolute disaster. And Lazarus seemed to be a disaster, but on the inside, Lazarus had it all together. As we read the story, the simple fact is that both of them lived and both of them died. And both of them found themselves in eternity. Notice verse 22 as we continue reading. After the description, Jesus says, Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. Here's what I wrote down in my notes, and and I'd encourage you to write it down. The second thing is this. One minute after you die, both the prosperity and the pain of this life will end. Mark that down. Take it to the bank. One minute after you die, the prosperity and the pain of this life will end. Minutes before they passed away, these two guys were completely different. The rich man wanted for nothing, while Lazarus wanted for everything. The rich man was respected and honored, while Lazarus was disrespected and despised. But now that they died, both of them were on equal footing. You see, the rich man couldn't take his wealth with him. The rich man couldn't take his influence with him. I wrote down in my notes, you cannot take your wealth with you. We used to say in Spanish on a regular basis that you never see a bank truck following a hearse to the cemetery. Why is it? You can't take it with you. You cannot take your wealth with you. And by the way, the same truth goes for influence, it goes for power, it goes for talent, and it goes for charisma. All of those things are things that are valued in this life, but you and I cannot take them to eternity with us. The second thing that we see is this. (laughs) This ought to rejoice us. Not only cannot or you cannot take your wealth with you, but you will not have to take your suffering with you. Think about that this morning. Did you wake up with pain? Nobody wants to admit it. I did, all right? I know some of us are struggling. You will not have to take your suffering with you. Yesterday as I, as I preached the funeral right here, we talked about heaven, and I read out of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 where John makes this statement. He says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. And he makes this great statement. All of those things are gone forever. Can I get an amen, church? You see, one minute after you die, both the prosperity and the pain of this life will end. For both of these men, life as they knew it was over a new life was ahead of them what awaited them notice verse 23 let me start in verse 22 finally the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with abraham the rich man also died and was buried verse 23 and his soul went to the place of the dead depending upon what translation you have it might say hades it might say hell his soul went to the place of the dead there in torment He saw Abraham in the far distance with Abraham at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity on me. How how interesting is it that the man who was merciless during his life asked for mercy now. Father Abraham, have some pity on me. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish I am tormented, he says, in this flame. You see, both Lazarus and Dives, both Lazarus and the rich guy, take a one-way trip into eternity. Jesus said that the rich man finds himself in hell, while Lazarus finds himself in paradise. 
Let me, let me pause for a second because it's important to clarify a really important point. The rich man did not die and go to hell because he was rich. And the poor man did not die and go to paradise because he was poor. That's not what the text is teaching about. If that would be the case, our challenge to you would be go sell everything you have as quick as you possibly can. That's not the admonition of the passage. Here's what I want you to catch though, and it's the third thing I wrote down in my notes. One minute after you die, your eternal fate will be sealed. One minute after you die, you will know your eternal fate. Let me pause for a second. Contrary to what some churches teach, there is not an intermediate, there is not an intermediate state. There is no temporary punishment or purgatorial waiting room. No, eternity begins the moment life ends. The simple truth is this. Your last breath on earth will be your first breath in heaven or hell. Wrap your mind around that statement. Your last breath on earth will be your first breath in heaven or hell. Jesus tells us that the unbeliever, the one who is not a follower of Jesus, the one who is interested in himself, is instantly transported to hell. And the believer is immediately transported to heaven. A couple of truths that I wrote down that we can draw from this story is this. These guys were immediately aware of their condition. You see it in the text. They were immediately aware. There are several phrases within the passage that clearly indicate that the rich man was conscious. He was aware. He was very much alive in his eternal destination. Verse 24, he saw Abraham. Verse 24, he cried out. Verse 24, he recognized Lazarus. Verses 27 through 31, he remembered both of those guys instantly knew where they were. Notice verses 25 and 26. Lazarus, or the rich man had just said, send Lazarus, send somebody to put some water on my tongue for I'm tormented in the flame. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. Here's just a thought I didn't put in your notes that I'm still thinking through, think through this, but many of the wrongs in life will be righted in eternity. Not all of them, most certainly, but many of the wrongs in life will be righted in this eternity. The rich man, some would say, is getting what he deserved. Not because of karma. We certainly don't believe in karma. He's getting what he deserved because he lived his life oblivious to God. He lived his life as if God did not exist. While the beggar in his condition cried out to God, each and every day. And although his earthly life was miserable, he had a relationship with God. There's a second thing that we see in the passage that, that I want you to catch. Notice, notice verse 20, 26. And besides, Jesus says, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here. And no one can cross over to us from there. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the great divide. That great chasm that separates those in heaven and those in hell. In the Greek, it's very interesting. There is a purpose clause. After he mentions the chasm, he says, so that. What's the idea? To keep. The, uh, the condemned in Hades, and to keep the righteous from crossing over and giving aid. Here's what Jesus said. This was a hopeless condition for the rich man. Well, 
One writer said it this way, that as Abraham hears his request, Abraham begins to respond with a sympathetic ear because he calls him son. In verse 25, but Abraham said to him, son, remember. But the author said that Abraham quickly goes from being tender to being hard-hearted because the rest of the verse, the author said this, basically says, tough noogies. (laughs) You're in your permanent location. The text seems to indicate that once we are in our eternal abode, that cannot change. Now, I want to pause for a second, and I want us to consider a very difficult question. Because maybe you're here today, and you're struggling with different aspects of of, of Christianity. You're struggling with different aspects of biblical truth and As we read this, there's a question that cries out from your mind. And the question that cries out from your mind is this. Wait a second, Brian. I thought the Bible says that God is love. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? I admit, that's a tough question. It was C.S. Lewis, the theologian, who said this. C.S. Lewis said, there's no other doctrine with which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than hell if it lay in my power I would pay any price to be able to say truthfully all will be saved but what C.S. Lewis came to realize and what we realize from scripture is that's not what the Bible teaches the Bible's very clear I wrote down two things the first thing that I wrote down is this that hell is a place of personal suffering. Notice in verse 24, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish. Your Bible might say, I am tormented in these flames. One of the great theological debates is in reference to the reality of suffering. Is the, is the suffering of hell physical or psychological? Are the flames real or are the flames symbolic? Where people really suffer for all of eternity. Listen, that, that question is way beyond my pay grade. Let me tell you what the Bible says, though. And I can just depend upon the Bible. Matthew 5, 22, but I say even if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the courts. And if you curse someone, you are in danger, Jesus says, of the fires of hell. Mark 9, 47 and 48, and if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, Jesus says. Where the maggots never die and the fire, Jesus says, never goes out. Revelation 20 and verse 15, anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown, was cast, was thrust into the lake of fire. Chuck Swindoll says this, the Bible clearly teaches that eternal judgment will be by fire. That was repeated so often from Jesus' lips that we are not free to make the text say anything else. The Bible says hell is a place of personal suffering. But how, you ask, how could God do that? Catch this point today. Hell is the justified response of sin against a holy God. Let me say it again. Hell is a justified response of sin against a holy God. You see, the penalty for sin is is not determined by our sensitivities It's not determined by our evaluation. I wrote down two thoughts under that point. The first is this. The penalty for sin is determined by the magnitude of the one who is sinned against. Catch that. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. The penalty for sin is determined by the magnitude of the one who is sinned against. If you sin against an infinitely holy and eternal God, you are infinitely guilty and worthy of eternal punishment. David Platt has just written a book called Follow Me. Great book. We're taking our life group through it. 
In the book, Follow Me, David Platt gives the illustration. He's in a Middle Eastern country, and he has a, a friend named Azim, who is a Middle Eastern believer. He'd come to Jesus Christ, and, and Azim was in a taxi riding with this uh, Middle Eastern taxi driver telling him about Jesus. And Azim relates the story that the Middle Eastern taxi driver asked the question, wait a second, how could God allow someone to go to hell? And Azim responded this way. He asked the taxi driver, he said, if I slapped you in the face right now, what would you do to me? The taxi driver turned around and said, well, I'd probably throw you out of my taxi. You'd be right in doing so, Azim said. Azim said, okay, what if I went up to a random guy on the street, never even met this guy before, and I slapped him in the face? What would he do? The taxi driver said, well, he'd probably call some of his friends and he'd probably beat you up. I would deserve it, Azim said. Azim said, what if I went to a police officer and I slapped a police officer in the face? The Middle Eastern taxi driver said, well, you probably still would get beat up, but you would end up in prison as well. And then Azim asked him, what happens if I go to the king of your country and I slap the king of your country in the face? The taxi driver says, you'll die. The king will kill you. You see, here's the idea. The penalty for sin. We have have such this idea of justice in our mind. The penalty for sin is determined by the magnitude of the person that you sin against. And when an individual sins against an infinitely holy, an infinitely wise an infinitely compassionate, an infinitely eternal God. Jesus says that that person is infinitely guilty. That's tough stuff. Let me, let me wrap all of that up in this package because some people would say, still doesn't make sense to me. Boy, it seems rather unloving from God, doesn't it? It would be if God in the story did not become the victim. But Jesus said, you know what? That's not what I want for you. As a matter of fact, that's not what I created for you. I created you so that you could enjoy me for all of eternity. You're the one who blew it, not me. But here's what I'm going to do. I love you so much that I am going to become the victim for you. And I am going to take your place. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. The Bible says this way, that Jesus the just died for the unjust. Jesus the perfect died for the imperfect. Jesus for the holy died for for sinners. Man, someone could say, even though it wouldn't be true because a holy, righteous God can do anything he wants, but someone could, in theory, accuse Jesus of being unjust if Jesus didn't say, let me take the punishment for you. But the simple fact is that Jesus offers and the world rejects. And the world continues to live in a way that is anti God, rebelling against an infinitely holy God. You see, man's problem is not just that he has made some bad decisions or that he or she has messed up. No, at the core of his being, man, you and I have rebelled against a holy God. That's what Jesus says in the passage. Notice verse 27 as we draw this to a close. The rich man then said, the rich man gets it. The rich man then said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him, at least send Lazarus to my father's home, for I have five brothers. 
I want to warn them so that they don't end up in this place of torment. Man, this merciful, mercy, mercifulest guy all of a sudden is feeling mercy. I got five other brothers that are still on the other side of eternity. I don't want them to spend eternity here. Abraham, if you would send Lazarus back to tell them that this place exists, warn them so that they don't come here. Verse 29, but Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead... Then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. Here's what I wrote in my notes. God's word is all the witness that we need. God's word is sufficient. We don't need people to rise from the dead. We don't need people to perform astonishing miracles. I wrote down in my notes, if a person will not believe the Bible, they will not believe even if a person rises from the dead. Abraham says they have all the witness that they need. Have them believe the prophets. But there's one final thought We know the rest of the story. The rest of the story is prophetic because Jesus realizes that in just a few short days, he would die. And he would, three days later, just as he prophesied, rise from the dead. And Jesus realized that's going to happen. And they still won't believe. The word of God is sufficient. Let me ask you this morning two thought-provoking questions. Question number one is this. Where will you be one minute after you die? Great question, Brian. I'm not ready to think about it. Now's the time to think about it. Not a single one of us here that has the promise of tomorrow. I'm certainly not a prophet, but I have... I have preached more than enough funerals in my lifetime of people who thought that they had a lifetime ahead of them and their life was cut short earlier than they ever planned. Where will you be one moment after you die? The moment you die, all the prosperity of this life, all the pain of this life instantly ends. And the moment you die, Your eternal fate is determined. At that moment, you can do nothing else. Man, church, do you know Jesus? One of the the big fears that I have as a pastor, one of the things that burden me more than anybody else is that somebody will sit in our services. They'll attend Hollywood Community Church. They'll sing with Vernita and James and the praise team. They'll hear Brian and and Brad and Jose and others teach God's word. And yet they will not prepare for eternity. Are you ready for eternity? You see, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die you see the truth of the gospel is that God wants all of us God wants all of us to come to repentance God created us for us to have communion and fellowship with him and even though we blew it God said don't worry about it I'm going to take care of it I'm going to pay the price of your sin just trust me and instead of putting our trust in the only one that can save us We have a tendency to try to do it on our own, and we can't. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, there's a wide road, and many people are on it, but it leads to destruction. And there's a narrow road that leads to eternal life, and very few find it. 
Jesus said in John chapter 14, he told the disciples, I'm going to be leaving and I'm going to be going away. And Thomas said, where are you going? We want to go with you. Jesus said, no, you can't go with me now. Well, Lord, how can we know where you're going? How can we follow you there? And Jesus made this great statement. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody gets to God except through me. You see, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the road. Jesus is the airplane. Jesus is that means of travel that's going to get us there. Do you know Jesus? Where will you be one minute after you die? If you don't know, I'd love to help you know that. I'd love to. Church, let me ask you one more question. Where will your friends and family be one minute after they die? Preached way too many funerals for us to think that it's not going to happen. And it's going to happen. And when you stand over the casket of that husband or that wife, or God forbid that son or that daughter, that mom or that dad, are you going to have the confidence that they're with the Lord? And you're going to have the confidence that you're going to see them again. Paul says in First Thessalonians, we grieve, but we grieve differently than those that have no hope. Because we have hope. We have hope. You see, if we know our family and friends are believers, we know one, out, one minute after they die where they're going to go. You say, Brian, what can I do? What can I do? Man, you can cry out to God for your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad, your neighbor, your coworker, your best friend. You can cry out to God for them. And you can ask God to help you be a witness to point them to Jesus.